ISO FileMaker Magazine, the professional's resource for FileMaker know-how. Hey there, this is Matt bringing you yet another FileMaker tutorial video. Actually, this isn't a tutorial. This is an introduction. We've got FileMaker 20 that has just been released. You want to know all the details about it? Let's head over to my desktop and take a look at what I've got. All right, thanks for joining me. Here it is, right here. There's the new icon. Now a new icon is basically just a new representation of the same thing that we are used to. In this video, I'm going to be going through the few things that we have on screen. You can see them as I highlight them right here on the side. I just have seven slides, uh, but if you have not updated to FileMaker 19 or to 20, stay tuned in this video because I'm going to be going through all of the things that they released from the time that they released FileMaker 19 until FileMaker 20. The first part of this video is going to be FileMaker 20 new features. And then the second part is going to be everything that happened from the time that they released FileMaker 19 in between 20 and all of those features. But let's get into the features for FileMaker 20. All right, so our first feature is going to be on window transaction. Now I'm going to be going through a, a little bit of detail in these. I won't be doing it exhaustively because there's going to be all kinds of videos that come out about these features. But essentially the on window transaction, which we don't want to confuse with the recently released in 19.6, the open transaction, commit transaction, revert transaction, they do relate to that, but in essence, the on window transaction event, which is specified for the file and operates on a window by window basis has a new feature. In fact, we can see right here, it is a file specific event. So it's not something you put on a layout and it's not something you put on a field. So it's not an on object or an on layout. It is an on file for each and every window. And that's because FileMaker can have multiple windows open. Now you can see that we've got this section op, the second option that I've highlighted right there of a field name that you can specify. Now this isn't on any of the other triggers that we are used to in FileMaker and it essentially works like this. The on window transaction will fire each and every time that there is a database transaction. Now if you're used to the word uh, CRUD, which stands for uh, create, read, update, or delete, those are database operations and in FileMaker any time that we have a commit or something that happens where data is either created, modified, or deleted, that's when this particular script will fire every time on any window. And so you have the opportunity to do what's called remote logging. And I'm calling it remote logging because this field that I have highlighted right here, this audit log, which we're going to take a look at this a little bit more in depth. I'll show you an overview of how it works allows you to specify what you want to capture and where you want to send it. Now this is not going to be in the same record in the same file. And that's because using the on window transaction would recursively call itself over and over and over because it happens after the commit has actually been, uh, after it's actually happened, after the data has been committed the results of that transaction are passed into a script via an auto-generated uh, parameter. And we'll take a look at that. And that is the first major new feature in FileMaker 20. Now let's look at the next. Okay, our next biggest feature is going to be what we have on screen right here, P uh, perform script on server with a callback. Now this one is simply just a different way to do some of the same things that you could. If we take a look at what we have on screen here, I've got a number of scripts that I've got right there. In fact, we'll zoom in on those. So this is a script called perform script on server, PSOS, which is what we call it as developers with callback. Now this is just a different way of dealing with the result that you get back, or you don't have to deal with the result per se. So first off, this works as a server side script. So you're going to call a script on server it's going to return some results. And then normally you would just be able to continue through that same script, dealing with the results however you wanted to deal with them. Well, now we have an additional option. It is this callback notion. Now a callback is basically, you know, something happens somewhere else. And then as a result of that, it calls back to the 
origination or where that original call came from. So in this case, you can see that we have this new script step that right here it says perform script on server with the callback. What is the callback that you want to call? And in this case, you get to specify this script. Now in this example, what I'm doing is you can see that I'm passing a parameter right there of whatever the script result was of what you had called on the server. So in this scenario, if we take a look at it, what I did is I run this script, this script calls this script on server, it exits that script with the result, which allows me to get that result with the get script result that we can see right there. But prior to running the remainder of the steps in this script, which is where my mouse is highlighting right now, I would run the rest of the scripts. Prior to that, we get the opportunity to call a script, which is basically the callback, callback script. So you can probably do more or less the same things, but this gives us a new way of branching our logic and doing different things within FileMaker, which is essentially going to open up more possibilities. So that's our second of our three major features here in FileMaker 20, or what I'm considering the three major features. All right, and big feature number three, at least as far as I'm concerned is triggering a Claris Connect flow. Now, if you've looked at Claris's resources and what they've released, there's all kinds of new things in different areas of FileMaker. This video, of course, is covering the client, the development environment, and how we interact. The only thing, else, other thing I have in here is just the release about server, which you can see over there, server 20 got ARM support, which we're going to actually look at. But here what we have is the ability to trigger a connect workflow from within FileMaker, which is a really big thing, combined with the fact that you're going to be able to access and use connect I believe on their free tier, which is actually pretty cool. So you can start to play with this. Now, when it comes to executing remote things that deal with remote APIs, we've long had the ability to use uh, Node Red, um, making direct calls using insert from URL, which has full curl support. What we have here is just a, a really nice convenience. Uh, Claris is baking into FileMaker the ability to call their own API service, Claris Connect, and it's pretty much going to be a lot easier. You can see right here that we have an app ID where we can specify our key, which you're always wanting some type of authentication when you're whenever you're using an API. And we get to basically specify a URL and the outbound JSON. And again, this was probably something you could do with insert from URL, but not having used connect myself a whole lot. I don't know if you were able to directly call connect with insert from URL, but definitely you were to any URLs. You could simply use that. But we have this convenience in here, and it's going to be a lot easier for us to test and use because of being able to go work with Claris Connect. All right, so what are some of the other things that they've added into FileMaker 20 for this release? And the reason that FileMaker, in the past, the previous video that I shot for FileMaker 19, I think it was almost two years ago, and that's because FileMaker has gone to a different release where they are releasing on point releases, and that's what the remainder of this video is going to cover, everything from the original 19.0 all the way up to this 20 release. But as you can see on screen, we have some new additions. So in essence, what we had were design functions where it was table names or table IDs, and you would be able to get table name or get layout table name. But now what we've done is, or what Claris has done, is added in base tables. So in other words, rather than looking at the graph and getting all occurrences, you're now able to get just the base tables listed within the manage database area. So you can see that we have a base table names, that's a design function, a base table IDs, another design function, a get base table name, which is more than likely probably in the miscellaneous section. And then we have the FileMaker underscore base tables, and that's something that you're going to use with the execute SQL step within FileMaker function, I should say. And that's just going to allow you to uh, get results quicker because uh, it's not returning as much data back. Moving on, we do have uh, send mail is garnered a new feature of the ability to work with OAuth 2.0. 
Now, um, I believe in FileMaker's documentation, they're going to reference uh, Microsoft 365 or a Google Workspace. Of course, it will probably work with any, well, it should work with any OAuth 2.0 uh, service provider, provided you can get all the authentication information that you need for the back and forth, and then you'll be able to send mail out of FileMaker. Here are some miscellaneous enhancements that they made. Um, PDF thumbnail, the generation on Windows is uh, now working. A lot of these things are basically, they were released originally on the Mac, but then they get support later on for Windows because the Mac OS has these features built in, such as reading a QR code from a container that's now available on Windows and Linux. Um, you also have the get live text, which is a feature that came out available through, uh, I think, Monterey, but now it's available on Ventura and iOS 16, and that's through server-side support, and that's just supporting some additional lang languages there. Um, that, again, is prob that's Mac OS only, not a Windows-specific feature. Um, if it says the word Windows, that's when we have a Windows capability. Um, get cache file path and get cache file name, something that I had not played with a whole lot. I don't know if that's with uh, going to deal with the ability of using maybe FileMaker's file functions in order to delete the file, uh, the cache files that fi the client generates. Um, what these are going to be specifically used for in relation to a developer, I'm not exactly clear yet. Dark mode. Um, if you like dark mode, they've got support for that in the relationship graph. And for the most part, the biggest thing that we got as a result of FileMaker 20 is one of the things that they're being really good at over at Claris is fixing a lot of things. Old things, new things. The, the list of fixes, some of them are minor and inconsequential, and it really doesn't warrant me going through um, them individually on a slide here. But um, say, for example, I had a video here on YouTube that talked about FileMaker had a memory bug uh, with substring functions. Well, they've fixed that, presumably. Um, we're going to have to see as time goes on with this release of FileMaker 20 how many different fixes are helping. But remember, at the same time, because they're releasing so frequently, it's possible that new little bugs get introduced. So even though there may be a fix... They are moving very quickly with their releases. And finally, in terms of FileMaker 20, we've got ARM support. Now, this is a big one. If you've been on a Macintosh and you've been using an M1 or now an M2 chip, you know that what happened was it was taken away from us as developers the ability to either run a local machine or a Docker container or running FileMaker server directly on our ARM-based machines. This to me is a really big one. It's not specific to client. It is specific to FileMaker server, but this this is cool. I run a I run in a Parallels VM running Ubuntu 22, and as you can see on screen, we have the ability to now run within ARM 64. We were always able to run on AMD 64, um, which are going to be your Intel machines, but this is absolutely wonderful. In fact, um, server is even including a Docker install script, as far as I know, for um, Ubuntu 22. In fact, I mentioned that right there, which is a really cool thing. So what we're going to do right now is you, if you are interested, I wanted to introduce you to the features that are available. I wanted to give you the first five minutes. You know what's new in FileMaker 20 now. If you want to know the details of how these work and see a little bit, then I'm going to cover the on-window transaction coming up really quickly here. And if you want to know and have not updated to FileMaker 19, and you'd like to know everything that happened between the initial 19.0 release and FileMaker 20, I'm going to be going through a separate file and covering each of those so that you know, okay, I'm still using FileMaker 18, or I'm still using FileMaker 17. Should I update to FileMaker 20, and is it worth it? In my opinion, it absolutely is. The on-window transaction, the transaction support that came in 19.6, many of the other little things have made FileMaker absolutely a worthwhile upgrade, especially if you're on 16, 17. Maybe you could still hang with 18, but even with 18, you're going to want to jump to FileMaker 20 for the wealth of things that you have access to because of all the releases. So let's go through these transactions, take a little bit of a deeper dive into how they work so that you have an understanding, and then we'll cover all that 19.1 to 19.6 goodness. 
Okay, so this on window transaction, how does this work? I want to make this as simple as possible because it's going to be very easy to get confused about the utility of this and how can it how it can be used. And there's going to be some techniques. I can imagine there are going to be some really cool things. What this essentially is is a trigger that fires on each window where a given transaction happens. Now a transaction in FileMaker is any time that you do a create, an update, or a delete. So any operation that affects the data is considered a transaction. We don't want to confuse that with the fact that in 19.6, we got the ability to explicitly say, you are going to open a transaction, meaning you are going to effectively work on not just the record that I'm looking at here on screen, but potentially other records that are related via portals, what have you. You're going to collect all of those into one package. Think of it as putting a bunch of different things into a box. And then you're going to send that box off to server and server is going to then open the box and say, this has everything in the right place, in the right order. It's acceptable. I'll keep it and I'm going to update that data as opposed to server gets the box and it looks in there. It says, nope, something's wrong out of all of these things you've submitted. I'm going to send it back and that causes a revert. So when we look at what we have with the on window transaction, anytime that you do a create a modifier, a delete, what's going to happen is this script that you associate to this uh, particular event is going to fire. So don't get confused right here. This is the event on window transaction. I have named my script on window transaction. You can see right here that the name of the script. Now we're going to see this. I'm going to go up to the file. We are going to go to this area right here, the file options. We will bring that up. This is the same dialogue that we see much bigger right there. We're going to move to the script triggers. You can see that as I scroll down, we have an on window transaction that is calling my script of on window transaction. Now we see this additional item right here of the field name. What this essentially is, is every time that something happens that create, update, or delete in your database, this script will run. What you do with the data that FileMaker provides is up to you. Typically in the world of IT, what you want to do is when you have a bunch of servers or you have a uh, service such as an application, you want to log what happened and you want to get that off of that machine. And that's because it gives you the ability such that if a hacker hacks into that machine and the log is on the same machine, that's a problem because then the hacker can erase or completely remove the log. So for things like HIPAA compliance or anything where you need to know what the record was changed from and what they changed it to, and you want to track that, you're usually pushing that not in the file, the FileMaker file that you're working in, you push it to another FileMaker file or out to the operating system as a regular file or to a remote log. Um, in the world of Linux, it's uh, called syslog. And you can do remote syslogging to push that event to a logging uh, scenario. Now, what you track in terms of what the fields are when they were changed from one thing to another thing, you are in full control of, and that's where this field comes into play. Typically, you're going to, you're able to specify this field name right here. Now, it's going to have to be the same field name in every table where you want to track this information. So if we look at this in uh, its operation, what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up the debugger. Well, first we're going to go into define database and we're going to look at that field right there, audit log. Now, this is a calculated field. You can see now this could be, un it could be stored, but in this case I'm doing unstored because that means that my data is always uh, updated and current. Um, it really depends if your unstored calculated field was referencing a lot of unstored calculated fields through a lot of relationships. Not a good idea. Typically, you're going to do this, and what it's going to include is whatever fields you want to track. Now, FileMaker is a mishmash of 
fields that we use for our schema and our data and fields that we use for our UI in order to convey the user experience. So you're going to separate out your UI related fields and you're going to be focusing on your schema or your data related fields. So you can see right here, I am able to specify JSON. Now you can specify whatever structure you want. I happen to be using the get field name because it's convenient as the key value for the value of the field. And you can see right here, the result here is included in the auto created parameter to the on window transaction event. Now this is a key thing about the on window transaction. You do not control the parameter that's coming in. Let's head back over to that file options, take a look at the script triggers, scroll down, look at the on window transaction. Notice that we do not have the ability to specify a parameter. I can select the script, I can set the field, but on any of the script triggers, if we take a look at the on window first open, we look at that, there as well, we do not have the ability to specify a parameter. That is because FileMaker is, cre is creating the parameter for us. What we get to do is we get to ride along with that parameter and include the contents of this field. So because this field can be calculated, it can be a JSON object with all kinds of data, or it could just be one single piece of information. So you get to control what you pass along, provided that this field is the same name in all of your tables and it gets carried along. So let's take a look at this. We open the debugger. I have the feature turned on. We just saw that. Here is a, down at the bottom, we have a normal edit field. This is just a field called field. This is my audit log field right here. So when I select in here and I am going to update, I'm going to type the word update. So I've updated this field. FileMaker, if you don't already know, uses an implicit commit. It does not use an explicit commit where we say, you are going to commit this, although you can turn that on very much so using the open and the commit transaction script steps and other ways as well. But in this case, an implicit commit is anything where I get off of this record. I could be using the feature that we have up at the top right here where I move from one record to another because I got off of this record and went to another record. It's implied that there is a commit. As soon as I click outside of this field, it is implied that that is a commit. So when I click, we can see that the on window transaction event has fired. It is calling my script called on window transaction. And we can see that I have a set variable of automatic parameter. In other words, we didn't get to control the parameter, but we got to control what came along with it as a result of that field. So when I advance this, which I will do right there, and then I will show the data viewer, which we will switch over to our current tab and we will take a look at the contents of my automatic parameter. And I make this window a little bit smaller so that we can see what's going on. We can see what actually gets passed in. So again, Claris is controlling this. We do not have control over the fact that one, JSON is being used, and two, there is a structure that has been applied, and it comes in this format. We have the name of the file. We have the name of the base table, not the table occurrence. And then we have what happened. Was it created? Was it modified or was it deleted? Then we have the internal record ID. This is the free field that we get with the get record ID value. Then we have the results of whatever was in the field that we specified provided it's on the table. And that's what comes in. So this could be an object of all the values of what they were modified to. Um, what they were modified from would have been captured in a previous commit. For example, uh, the very first time the record was created, this would not say modified, it would say created. It would have the ID of the record, and then we would have all of those field values at the creation point, and we would be able to compare that in one record versus an another record, and we would have a history, basically an audit log, of every time that this particular record 
had been modified. And that's essentially what we're looking at. I also want to make note of, as we move into the script here and take a look at some of the comments, because this is where you can get confused. Um, note, this happens after the transaction has been committed. So meaning the data has already been written and this script is now called. Typically, you'll capture this into another file. You're not going to, you're not using this to create an audit log in a field on the same record. It won't work because if you did a set field into the same record, the on window transaction will be called over and over and over again. It would be an infinite loop. And so that's where you are going to be sending your data out to another table in the same file or hopefully another file maker file or out to the operating system or to a, uh, a logging a application, which could be syslog or what have you. Um, there's just a, a variety of things that you can do with this particular feature. But in essence, what we have is we have a cheap, I wouldn't call it cheap, we have a free audit logging functionality built into FileMaker now. You, you get it, and it's part of the FileMaker 20 release. That itself is really pretty cool. That is the biggest major feature that we have here in FileMaker 20, and that is essentially how it works. All right, so there we go with the FileMaker 20 release and the major new features that we have access to. Again, because of how FileMaker or how Claris is releasing FileMaker and also Claris Pro, and remember Claris Pro is basically a clone of FileMaker Pro with some core functionality removed. In that, what do we what is the biggest thing? Well, it's basically authentication. The biggest difference between FileMaker 20 and then whatever the matching number to Claris is, I think it's going to be in the 40s or something like that, is Claris Pro is going to be using exclusively the Claris ID or the, uh, the way that you get in and out of a Claris Pro database is through that one singular method. You can't use Azure, you can't use AWS, you can't use Google, you can't use FileMaker Native. It is basically a lock-in to using the Claris system, which is convenient in one sense, but in my opinion, I would pref I prefer the flexibility of FileMaker Pro. I, I hope FileMaker doesn't go away. We will see what happens as a result, but also with Claris Pro, you get access to Claris Studio. There are videos here on YouTube that talk about it, but that is the biggest primary difference is how you get into accessing your data, but the way that they both work is exactly the same. So what we're going to do for the remainder of this video, if you want to stay tuned in, is if you have not kept up with what has been released in FileMaker 19.0 all the way up to this release of 19.20, or excuse me, not 19.20, uh, FileMaker 20, then that's what I'm going to be going over in the rest of this video. We're going to do it really quickly. It's just going to be a one, two, three, four. I'm not going to be explaining any features like I did here with the on-window transaction because that would just be a super, super long video. But if you want to know what has been released since FileMaker 19.0, let's take a look right now. All right, if you have not kept up to date with FileMaker ever since the 19.0 release, which happened actually almost three years ago to the date of release, uh, this release of FileMaker 20, then we're going to be going through that. We've got 22 items. We can see that right here that I'm going to breeze through. These are all the things that were released from the time that I released my original video in May of uh, 2020. These are the things that came out. Maybe you've used some of them. Maybe some of them you didn't know about. All right. First off, the easiest thing as I come up, I get my little notification here about FileMaker asking for all my connections. We'll go ahead and say that. In fact, I should go up here and turn off little snitch, my reverse proxy. Go to allow connections so that we don't get those dialog notifications anymore. What we have is, if you are interested in the release notes, first off, this file and the FileMaker 20 file will be available. They'll be linked below in the YouTube description so that you can open these files, play with the features. What I've done is in the scripting workspace, you can see that you can go into the workspace and then I've got the uh, different releases. Um, I don't think I have the, for example, the 19.1 or the 19.2, 19.3. Um, when I added those in, but I started the FileMaker 20 file will have um, 
a little a few more of these with the 19.6 etc i've just started collecting whatever is new from a script or whatever standpoint into a dedicated folder and those will be available in the file if you want the details the specifics because there's so many things to go over this first item right here the dot releases links to an article on the claris help pages where they have all of the individual updates and this is where you can find all of the nitty-gritty details um, all the way down to the fixes that have been made so if there's something that you are interested in about claris filemaker wondering whether it's been fixed that's what you're going to be able to do Having said that, let's go through the major features. Add-ons were added. They added some new add-ons as a result of the 19.0. They just fixed a lot of the JavaScript. A lot of these add-ons, they use JavaScript within a web viewer in order to accomplish things. They needed to fix things up, make them work on Windows as well as they should on, they did on Mac, etc. Um, Azure, uh, or excuse me, Active Directory Federated Services. If you used this within your domain controller uh, in a Windows environment, this was made available in both server and then also client could access this. You can see in this screenshot that we have the um, Active Directory Federated Services is here and available. Um, we switch to, this is the server side that you use to set up. Then we look at the client side. On the client side, you're simply going to specify that you're using an external server and you're going to set up the name of the group from the Active Directory uh, server in terms of authentication. And then Active Directory takes care of it and then lets the FileMaker uh, user in. Um, another thing that was added was a get locale. And if you're not a developer and you're not aware, anytime that we use these little stars, it simply means that this is a variable piece of information. So in this regard, what we have are two different things. We can see that we've got get system locale elements. And then we're also going to have a companion get file locale elements. And this is basically just a super long JSON list of all of the things that are specific to the file or to the system being used. So in other words, you're going to use the system if you want to know what the user's system is. If it's, you know, other than the file. If the file is set to English, but their system is Spanish, you're able to get the differentiation between the two because of those two different calls. The FileMaker Perform Script with Option was updated. This was a very big uh, change that was a little small thing within uh, FileMaker. So originally when FileMaker 19.0 came out, the ability for bi-directional communication with a web viewer was released. That was a big thing. There were also some limitations that were taken off that on the Windows side, the amount of data that you could pass through a script uh, was significantly enhanced, making it much more viable to do things with JavaScript. So they needed to make some changes and we got all of these different um, options for how and when a script would trigger as a result of something coming out of a web viewer via JavaScript. So in other words, do I run the script immediately or do I add it to the queue and wait for all of the other scripts to finish? And that's what these numbers essentially do is they allow you to halt the current script or exit this current script or uh, our most common is pausing the current script or to continue, which I believe the default is zero. Also on here is a web viewer with beeswax. They are the first people that I am aware of that taught you how to enable WebKit. Now WebKit, if you have not kept up with interacting with uh, JavaScript within web viewers within FileMaker, is the easier way to debug JavaScript than on Windows. Unfortunately, because FileMaker is uh, Claris Pro and FileMaker Pro is such a heavily Mac focused application, they get a little bit more of the features and functionality than we do on Windows. It is possible on Windows. Go look, um, Salient has a lot of articles where they talk about debugging uh, JavaScript, but what we're talking about is the ability to right click right here and then choosing this option of inspect element. This will not come up by default on a Macintosh or on Windows at all um, until you turn on the feature within the preferences for the operating system or for FileMaker. So when I am able to bring up this uh, inspect element, this is where I am able to literally type in code, JavaScript code. In fact, we can see right here, this FileMaker perform script, 
I can type right here in this little uh, window, if I start to type FileMaker, we can see that FileMaker comes up there as an option. If I hit the tab and then I hit a dot, which is our JavaScript notation, and start to type Perform Script, you can see the two different options that we have right there. Well, if I select the first one that FileMaker came out with in FileMaker 19, and then I hit return, what you're going to see is it actually calls the new variation that FileMaker released here in this uh, version, or the 19.1.2, uh, where they were adding the ability to have the state, which is basically all of these numbers that we just took a look at. So just a little bit of clarification. I want to go through these as quickly as possible, but I also want to give you the information so that you know how to actually use the feature. If you don't know how to turn the WebKit debugger on in FileMaker, then it's pointless. I'm telling you, hey, yeah, we've got this new FileMaker perform script, but you're like, okay, Matt, how do I use it? Well, I just told you. All right, NFC got uh, the ability to have JSON as output. I was in 19.1, 19.1.3 simply had the ability Again, it's the same thing that we just saw, the different states of execution of the FileMaker Perform script. Well, in this case, it comes in the form of the FMP URL. So you were able to pass as a query fragment the option of what you want to have happen when you actually call that script. And again, remember, as FileMaker has moved forward, Pay attention and note one of these other things is coming up. The very next one, in fact, deals with security. FileMaker did a lot of things from if you're coming from 17, 18, or 16, and you had something that was previously working that now no longer works. It's because Claris locked it down based on security. In fact, let's take a quick hop into the um, accounts We'll select this. I'm going to go to the advanced settings here on this file, which currently has a default password. And we are going to look at the extended privileges. This is the one area where you see a lot of different changes over the course of time with FileMaker. And that's where we see the addition of um, the FM URL script, the FM uh, script access, the FM rest, the FMO data, and there's one that's not in this file currently because um, this file was created prior to the addition of that particular extended priv privilege. And that's what we're going to see here next is the FM plugin. Um, we will cancel, just cancel that. I can get out of that. So we have the URL option here again. This next feature released in uh, the 19.2. And one thing you should note, notice that as we go through these, it typically happens with a dot one release, but there are some new features that happen in a, say for example, a dot two. But for the most part, what Claris is doing um, when they remake a release is a new feature will be added in a dot one release, such as 19.4.1. Then if there's a problem with that, it goes from 19.4 to dot two or dot three or dot whatever. But most of your newer features come out with the dot one releases. But here again is a security related feature. We can see, you can read on screen. There is the FM plugin. So plugins were a security hole wherein a plugin could execute a SQL or get a list of scripts, do all kinds of things. And there wasn't a way to limit whether a plugin could do that or not. So. If your, uh, if your use of plugins stopped working, it's simply because this probably uh, is not in your older file. You need to add in the FM plugin, and then you need to turn it on for the privilege set that is trying to use the plugin. There's a lot of things over the 19 release that maybe you were used to them working in previous versions, and then all of a sudden they stop working. They're typically, it's tied to a privilege set. This was a big one uh, around the 19.3 release. We got Apple Silicon. That was the original support for ARM64. That was just the client. Of course, now, as you saw in 20, we have release for support for server with ARM64. Really big. Cool. So awesome, Claris. Uh, get model attributes dealt with core uh, ML. And this is when they made a change from the internal Internet Explorer to Chromium for the Windows side of things. FileMaker script shortcuts, they were originally released in 19.0 for iOS. So the shortcuts application, which was, oh God, I've been working with it 
for years before when it was created by another company and then Apple acquired it, but it's named Shortcuts. And it essentially allows you to interact and automate the operating system, but tie back into FileMaker. Well, that came available on the Mac OS with Monterey. And so you have the ability to use that. You just simply need to enable the Shortcuts donation. And then that becomes available within Shortcuts. Custom OAuth authentication. So um, OAuth started, uh, we didn't like being limited to, say, for example, just Amazon, Google, or Microsoft. Uh, we wanted to be able to do uh, use separate providers. So we got access to custom OAuth right there. And as you're going to see, they eventually added Apple ID as well. Session identifiers. Because of Web Direct and the way that it works, um, it's very difficult sometimes on server to differentiate uh connecting clients one from the other so they gave us the ability with a script step that you would typically use on startup to set a session identifier and this allows you to distinguish uh, looking at the admin console and filemaker server uh, who's logged in uh, is it an anonymous is it an authenticated account what are they doing and you have the ability to basically set um, whatever you want in terms of how you identify a particular session um, FileMaker base table, base table fields. This was the first edition, and now we can see that uh, Claris has wrapped it up with FileMaker 20 that we saw at the beginning of this video. We have base table uh, for everything else, where in FileMaker, what was it, 19.4 here, this was the first of their release. And again, this deals with SQL. You're only going to be using this with the execute SQL, but there's a lot of techniques and things that you can do with this. In fact, I've showed videos on the FileMaker Magazine website how you can use Execute SQL and set up a result that turns your SQL result into valid JSON in order to do all kinds of really cool things. There's a really awesome custom menu that uh, I've created and used in a lot of different solutions. You can find that on the FileMaker Magazine website. Uh, the data API got an offset and a limit for related data. We always had a limit and an offset with the data API. If you're not familiar with the Execute FileMaker data API, this is a script step that is not just something that you use when you're talking with a FileMaker client to a separate FileMaker server. Um, in a scenario, maybe you have two different FileMaker servers and you've got a solution on one FileMaker server and you're not using FileMaker to connect directly to other FileMaker files on that other server. You're basically using FileMaker's data API to make a API call to that FileMaker server and get data back. Well, if you don't know, we actually get to use this data API call for free internally within FileMaker. In other words, you can use this script step of execute FileMaker data API and get anything from your current FileMaker file returned back as JSON. And that's a really big benefit that we got in 19. Uh, well, we got we had the, the function call before, but with re, uh, with regards to related data that the data API returns back, we got an offset and a limit, and you need to specify the name of the portal in order to actually uh, limit what comes back. In this case, what we have on screen is it's saying, from the welcome layout, whatever fields are on that layout, I want you to limit the result set to one record, and then for any portal that's named portal-name in this particular case, I want you to start at the second record and I only want you to get two records is how you would read this code that we have right there. So that was an addition that was added. The FMP URL warning was added. This was in the preferences. We can see that right there. It's at the bottom. Warn me before an FMP URL opens a file. If you have not turned this on and you are security conscious, then just go turn it on. It's a machine by machine preference uh, specific to the user. And this is going to jump as I make these selections here. Get element type. We can see right here. This was a big one. Now, when it comes to being a developer, um, I have to say, I, as a FileMaker developer, focus on things that in the environment are specific to me. That's why I said the top three things with the FileMaker 20. There may be little fixes that impacted you, but for me, this is a big one. This is a performance enhancement that you can see on screen. 
Typically what we had to do in order to verify and validate that JSON was valid is we had to look at everything that we see right here. And so you see this really funky code right here. I want you to use the left function after you have formatted the elements, which can be an expensive process if you've got a really large amount of JSON. Why do we have to format that just in order to determine whether the leftmost character is actually a question mark? Well, in this particular case, now JSON coming back is either going to be an object or it's going to be an array. So you can use the JSON get element and it needs to be equal to an array or a JSON object. And simply this value, JSON array, JSON object, JSON string, JSON number, they all directly map to a number value. And I believe this could essentially say get element type equals to three and four is what that could be. Get live text and read QR, uh, QR code. These were released in 19.5, a little bit closer to our FileMaker 20 release, but we saw in FileMaker 20, we got access to those with Windows. Transaction support. This was the biggie throughout the course of the FileMaker 19 release. What we see on screen with the open transaction, commit transaction, and the one that's not on screen is revert transaction. Those three steps, which we can see right here, were added to 19.6. This was the start of what I would say File Claris and FileMaker paying attention to corporate America. So in other words, the ability to ensure that a, a transaction is atomic and it happens or it doesn't, it passes or it fails, um, as along with now adding in um, audit logs and the ability to have that audit log go out of the database system to a separate location. These are the types of things that make FileMaker as a system more professional, in my opinion, as a developer. But you can see right here, um, this is the biggest thing, actually. Let me get, get this on screen. Uh, Vince Manano over at Beeswax, many other uh, bloggers and developers, uh, and I should say development houses, have released all kinds of content. Wim DeCourt, brilliant guy over at Saliant, releases all kinds of stuff about FileMaker server and high-level stuff about transactions. If you just want to understand the most simple thing that transactions has done for you is, is right here on screen, what I have. This Field, this particular script step, replace field contents. It's one of our most powerful script steps, but it's also one that prior to open and commit transaction was not a good thing to use because it could fail. It would do a partial replace. There was nothing in replace field com uh, contents, which you get to use FileMaker's calculation engine to run across a range of records. And this is really cool for go to related. So you would write a script and it would go to a related set of records that you know you want to affect. And your options were, I could write a looping script or I could basically write a replace field contents. Now on the relationship graph, the relationship graph takes into account all of the other things that are loading. So the most performant thing that you could do, knowing that FileMaker loads every single value from a record as related data, if you had a complex graph and you needed the fastest way to do something, you could create a separate connected group of table occurrences that only used the table occurrences that you needed. It was going to load all of the record data, but the replace field contents would be the fastest. But you would have a record lock. Or if any user had a record lock on any one of those given records, this one step of replace field contents would run across, let's say, 500 records, and let's say five users had five records open. Five out of those 500 records would not be updated. You wouldn't have any idea. You would just have the 495 records out of those 500. They would get changed but the five that were locked by other users would not, and you had no clue. This open transaction and commit transaction solved that where you can reliably use replace field contents and feel confident that you are either going to get a successful result or you are not. And that's what you're looking at on screen. That is the most simple way to understand what open transaction and commit transaction did for us, because if this failed, the replace never happened. It just didn't partially commit. 
It either does or it doesn't, and that was a cool thing. All right, functions that we got. We got an open transaction state, which supported transactions. We got UTC microseconds, which in FileMaker 20, we get uh, current UTC milliseconds. So an even smaller time frame, which is really good because it helps us with logging. Uh, microseconds for most logging would actually work where you're dealing with one one thousandth of a second. But now you've got an even smaller unit that you can use in FileMaker 20. Get last error detail. This was renamed from guess la get last external error detail, which stems all the way back to uh, a ODBC. Um, essentially, FileMaker was doing a lot of uh, error error handling in separate functions. What they did, they essentially consolidated everything into one function, last error detail, and then they're breaking it down into the type of detail you get within this particular function. They also introduced the get last error location, which this particular function is really helpful if you're having to debug a particular script because it will tell you the file name, the script name, and the line of code where the error actually happened, um, the line prior to where the get last error was actually called. So that was added in 19.6. 19.6 also got, uh, for those of you using foreign languages, the ability to set a dictionary. And then finally, as we already took a look at, we saw it earlier in the uh, screenshot of server, the ability to use Apple ID. So if any of those things, any of the 22 different items, 21, because we're not including the dot releases or the welcome probably, 20 items, any of those 20 items that we saw if any of them were things that you were dependent on, you now have access to them. If you're in FileMaker 18, 17, 16 earlier and you want to jump, do it. Because FileMaker 20 plus all of these changes in FileMaker 19.0 all the way up to 19.6 is just a ton of really valuable, useful things that you can use within the new FileMaker Pro. Okay, so there we have it. There is the FileMaker 20 release with everything that I've covered in, in between all the way up to, uh, all the way through FileMaker 19.0 to 19.6 and now FileMaker 20. If you've enjoyed this video, if you like learning about FileMaker, if you'd like to know how you can actually create your own software, I'm confident that if you head over to FileMakerMagazine.com, you're going to be able to find the videos that are going to help you learn how to create whatever you can think of in FileMaker. It is all possible. You can even get an app on the App Store, which I've done with FileMaker. I'd like to wish you much luck with your own FileMaker development. And if you have any questions or feedback, please feel free to leave a comment below. I hope this video has helped you out. Much luck. And until next time, happy FileMaking. We hope you've enjoyed this video tutorial. And we'd like to say thank you for your subscription and your support. If you're not already a subscriber, head on over to www.filemakermagazine.com slash subscribe for more information about the benefits of joining.